people should check their risk tolerance because we are seeing a lot of froth throughout the industry. The crypto bull run may have reached an inflection point. While Bitcoin has been ranging sideways for the last few months, a number of altcoins have been registering outstanding gains. The decline of Bitcoin's market dominance has sparked concerns around the sustainability of this bull cycle. We have some of the meme coins, for example, doing exceptionally well. And those are those are kind of warning signs uh, for, for the cycle. Tesla stopping Bitcoin payments due to environmental concerns has put more pressure on the market. How much upside potential is left in this Bitcoin bull run? Are competitors threatening Bitcoin's network effect? Facing uncertainty, what should investors do in order to protect their portfolio? To answer these questions, we reached out to strategic investor Lean Alden. So the last time you talked to us back in November, you predicted Bitcoin's growing network effect would propel it to a $1 trillion market cap. I think the market cap could easily go to over a trillion. Uh, because that's that's still a small fraction of gold's market cap. That target has been reached. So congrats for the successful prediction. Uh, the question now is how much steam is left in the Bitcoin bull cycle? And is there still upside potential or we reached already the top? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And admittedly, it's hard to answer. So if we look at, you know, a couple different indicators, they're telling us uh, somewhat conflicting things. Uh, and so, you know, we've had a, you know, two and a half month consolidation, uh, we built up a lot of, uh, you know, support here, but also a decent amount of resistance. Uh, and if you look at, you know, a bunch of indicators like, you know, the HODL wave, like, for example, the cycle of, of longer term uh, 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 holders selling into some of the new uh, bullishness, uh, that's not been as extensive as previous uh, cycles so far, uh, which generally indicates that there's probably still more to go. Uh, if you look at different momentum indicators, like, the you know, the how far above the market capitalization is compared to the, the realized capitalization, which is kind of a measure of cost basis uh, and others, other sort of, um, you know, uh, say deviations from moving averages. Uh, it never really had uh, quite the blow off top that it had in, in previous post having cycles. And so by a lot of those metrics, uh, you know, there's probably still upside to go. On the other hand, there are some indicators like the, the pie top indicator that have signaled a top. And so, you know, there are kind of uh, some mixed signals out there to, to you know, to be on the lookout for. Uh, and so my base case continues to be higher, uh, but it's certainly a much, uh, it's, it's a more mixed, uh, you know, kind of a less asymmetric outcome than it was, you know, when I made the call back in, in, in 2020 throughout that period. Uh, and so it's still in that, that inflection point where it, it could go either way, but my base case would be that there's probably still more to go in the cycle. And also I heard that you were also analyzing the flows uh, that are coming um, from cryptocurrency exchanges that are bigger than the flows coming into cryptocurrency exchanges. That should be also the sign that uh, investors are still piling up Bitcoins, right? Yeah, that's been actually one of the things that's different from every other cycle, because in previous cycles, you know, there was like small periods of time where, where coins left exchanges, uh, whereas this was by far the longest period of time where coins left exchanges. Uh, and, you know, there are so the most bullish version there is that you basically have, you know, this this big influx of corporate buyers and other institutional buyers locking up coins in cold storage that are probably not going to move for a while. Uh, the more kind of a neutral, uh, you know, interpretation of that is that, uh, you know, because of the rise of, of things like stable coins, uh, especially in this cycle, um, Bitcoin's less used as a unit of account for trading different crypto pairs. Uh, and so it's more of an asset in its own right, and therefore there needs to be fewer of it on exchanges because stable coins have have somewhat taken that role uh, in the industry. And so you can you know bulls and bears can kind of interpret that in different ways, uh, but overall that's certainly an interesting sign because we're not seeing coins go to exchanges like we'd often see towards the end of a bull cycle. In a recent interview, you said that at this point Bitcoin investors at least some of them, should think of de-risking their Bitcoin investment by taking some money off the table and putting it into other assets. So can you explain what is the rationale behind uh, this recommendation of yours? Yeah, it's not, a, it's not a recommendation more so as just people should check their risk tolerance because we are seeing a lot of froth throughout the industry. You know, we have, we have some of the meme coins, for example, doing exceptionally well. And those are, those are kind of warning signs uh, for, for the cycle. Uh, and so, you know, for me, I had the ironic problem where, you know, I, I invested in Bitcoin early last year uh, as, a, you know, kind of a moderate position. Uh, but when that goes up like, you know, 8x, that's suddenly a very large position. 
And so then you're basically managing uh, that large position relative to the other, other positions in the account. And eventually there could come a time where rebalancing would make sense. Uh, now, because I've done a lot of work in the protocol, I have a pretty high conviction on it. And so I'm, I'm fine with ha maintaining a pretty large position, uh, but different investors have different risk tolerances. And so some investors are not fine with you know that large percentage of their gain still being in a single asset. And so for people who would have trouble with you know drawdowns or periods of volatility, it can make sense to rebalance. And so it, it really comes down to uh, investors kind of analyzing their own behavior uh, related to volatility and making a call based on their own conviction on the asset class. Uh, Kraken's Dan Held theorized the idea of a super cycle. According to this theory, Bitcoin won't have the retracement typical of previous bear markets, and it will go straight to a million in a massive asymmetric move. So what do you think about this theory? Does it sound realistic to you? I think there's a realistic case for it. I mean, certainly as a, as a Bitcoin long, uh, you know, I, I'd like to see it happen. Uh, I, I try not to have aggressive scenarios as my base case. Uh, and so my base case basically is that as Bitcoin goes from you know, near at zero and as it becomes a larger and larger asset class, that each post having bull run will be a smaller percent gain than the one before it. And that's not necessarily going to be the case, but that's kind of my 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 base case assumption because as as you know the law of large numbers kicks in, it takes a lot more capital uh, to move uh, you know the price of the asset. And so you know my base case is that you know this will be a cycle, you know similar to 2017, uh, a little bit a little bit less perhaps. And that's kind of how I'm I'm looking out for for you know my own say, you know, position sizing and things like that. Now, the case for a larger cycle is that, you know, this is the first cycle where we have, uh, you know, a meaningful amount of institutions on board. Uh, some of them probably intend to hold permanently. Uh, you'll have, uh, you know, uh, uh, pools of capital that are interested in rebalancing, right? So if, if Bitcoin does really well, they might, they might trim it. Uh, we've already seen that in a couple of portfolios. On the other hand, if, if Bitcoin were to dip, they could rebalance back into it. Uh, and so, you know, basically, Bitcoin has been through enough cycles now that I think in, you know, a lot of investors, especially some of these large investors, are, are confident in it. And so they're willing to kind of you know, uh, buy the dip faster, you could say. And so my base case would be you know, that, that you know, in addition to maybe not having the, the same percent gains as previous cycles, that Bitcoin's drawdown, uh, I think, would also be less extreme uh, than some of the previous cycles. And so I don't know if I'm full on board with, you know, a, a super cycle theory, but I, I certainly think that it makes sense for that idea to be out there and for, for investors to kind of weigh the probability of that happening. If you had to think about a time frame, when do you think we'll see the end of the current cycle in terms of uh, time frame? Uh, 2020, end 2021, uh, mid 2022. Uh, do you have any ideas about that? I think there's a big variance there. Uh, so if you look at previous Bitcoin cycles, I mean, they generally got a little longer each time, um, uh, you know, and so they've been less explosive, but longer. Uh, and so if that trend were to continue, it could leak into 2022 uh, this time around. Um, if not, you know, if we look at some of the macro headwinds, for example, uh, you know, some of the employment benefits are expiring in the United States in, in September. Uh, and so basically it's a little bit less fiscal support that's going to be here. Uh, you know, we're starting to see, uh, you know, some Fed members get concerned about, uh, you know, uh, uh, market uh, kind of euphoria or, you know, potential for inflation. And so some of them have talked about tapering asset purchases. And so some of these like less liquid financial conditions could put downward pressure on some of these assets that have gone somewhat parabolic, uh, which in some ways, fortunately, is, is fine for Bitcoin because it's already been in this consolidation, whereas I'd be more concerned about, you know, uh, lesser tokens that have, say, gone absolutely vertical in recent months. Uh, but basically, you know, as we look out into quarter three uh, and then, you know, into quarter four, some of the macro risks uh, uh, grow a little bit. Mm -hmm. OK, so overall, an optimistic view, but still with uh, with some caveats to, to look at. Yes. Um, moving on. So in one of your latest articles, you said that uh, determining whether Bitcoin is a good place to allocate capital to or not ultimately depends on an investor's assessment of its network effect. So what are the main factors that we should look at uh, to understand uh, how uh, healthy this Bitcoin's network, network effect look, looks? Uh, so different ones. One is, uh, you know, the number of users, uh, you know, coming in, uh, both on-chain users and uh, estimates from exchanges. Uh, I've also, uh, you know, in this cycle, because we've had institutional adoption, 
uh, you know, mainly only in Bitcoin. There's some there's some funds that also buy Ethereum, uh, but then as you go down into the smaller coins, you know, there's not really a lot of institutional interest there. And so if you look at you know ways that Bitcoin and some of the other you know top protocols have been adopted into into institutions have been interesting. So you have things like PayPal integration, uh, you have you know Cash App integration for Bitcoin. Uh, you know, we just got news, for example, that NYDIG is partnering with banks so that people will be able to buy Bitcoin through their existing banking relationships in many cases. Uh, and so I keep uh, also keep looking for uh, new corporations that add uh, Bitcoin to their balance sheet. And so these are these are companies that, you know, they're not exchanges, they're not, uh, you know, Bitcoin native companies, but that decide to have a non-zero Bitcoin allocation, um, you know, uh, you know, I think not that many will go all in like, you know, MicroStrategy has. Uh, because he's like a Super Bowl, but I think you'll have you know more companies do uh, you know what say Square did, where they put an you know a smaller allocation of their cash into Bitcoin as kind of a longer term hedge for the rest of their cash position. Um, and so I, I look for different signs of uh, you know uh, progress there. I'm also watching things like you know some of the th- some of the apps that are being developed, making use of the Lightning Network and and you know the underlying technology that that like Lightning Labs is providing. Uh, we have like, you know, Strike Global and some of these other, uh, you know, uh, places that are starting to use Lightning uh, because that's, you know, that's not been around as long as Bitcoin. And so that's earlier in its, that layer is earlier in its, in its growth phase. And, but we're starting to see some, some, you know, potential use cases out of that for even, for example, fiat to fiat transfer using Bitcoin as an intermediary. And so there's a lot of signs like that that I look for uh, engaging Bitcoin's network health. One of the signals pointing at the strength of Bitcoin's network effect is its market dominance. So back in 2017, you decided not to invest in Bitcoin, among other things, because uh, its market dominance was declining. And uh, in the recent months, we are seeing a similar scenario. Bitcoin's market dominance has been going down. It currently sits at around 48%, down from 70% in January. So if this trends, if this trend continue, uh, couldn't it undermine Bitcoin's network effect? I think we have to look at that question over multiple business cycles. And so back in 2017, in addition to Bitcoin's dominance falling, we also had the Bitcoin and Bitcoin cash split, uh, which added extra extra uncertainty uh, for Bitcoin and that, and that ecosystem. Besides Bitcoin and Ethereum, a lot of the major coins that were around in the last cycle that chipped into Bitcoin's market dominance are not the same ones that are around in this cycle chipping into Bitcoin. So for example, in the last cycle, Dogecoin was not a meaningful uh, percentage of Bitcoin's market cap, whereas this time we have like the, the Dogecoin like meme spike uh, going on. It's been pretty, you know, persistent. Uh, you know, we also are seeing, uh, you know, a, a rise of a bunch of these, uh, you know, uh, DeFi tokens. We've seen Binance, uh, you know, come on the scene. Uh, and so uh, I'd be more concerned if I saw you know, protocols that say chipped into uh, Bitcoin's market dominance in one cycle and then chip even more into it in the, in the next market cycle. I think that's where it gets kind of concerning. And so far, we haven't seen that. I mean, the one that, you know, you can say comes close is Ethereum, uh, but that's still, you know, a, a, a not reached, say, all-time highs in terms of the ETH-BTC ratio. So if you were to mm-hmm. see that gaining market share on Bitcoin in multiple cycles, you know, that that's another kind of network effect in the industry to watch. Uh, but outside of those top two protocols, we see that you know the, the the wave of challengers keeps being a different wave of challengers, and so that's basically showing that in those bull markets, a lot of those tokens don't have longevity to get around to the next cycle. And so you know we'll see how Bitcoin's dominance does at say the other end of this bull market. You know we'll see after the bear market, kind of you know where where the chips fall in that cycle, and then where it starts rising from there to see which ones are are persistent. So focusing on on Ethereum. So Ethereum has been outperforming Bitcoin in 2021 so far, and its market dominance is increasing. So there is a lot of talk about this flipping a scenario in which uh, either replaces Bitcoin as the leading crypto. So how realistic is such a scenario, according to you? I think in a bull cycle, it's it's a low probability, but a non-zero probability. Uh, because, for example, if you look how explosive that you know Ethereum was in 2017, uh, you know, towards the end of it, that had a, a giant blow off top and, and really kind of took a meaningful, uh, you know, percentage of the market capitalization back then. Uh, and for example, that ETH to BTC ratio still hasn't reached that that cycle high. And so if you were to have another, you know, blow off top, uh, you know, it's certainly possible. I, I try not to prove a negative or rule out, uh, you know, improbable outcomes. Uh, but overall, that would still have a, a long way to go to kind of catch up with, with Bitcoin's market capitalization as it currently stands. And so overall, I think one of the risks of 
you know, any coin that's not trying to be a store of value like Bitcoin, uh, if, it, if it's kind of trying to do multiple things, it's easy for another competitor to come and be cheaper and take some of that share. And so my concern would be that you have, you have shifting kind of leaders in the utility space. Now, so far, Ethereum has been the main one, but we have to see how some of these rising competitors, uh, you know, uh, either either fail to take market share from it or, or continue to take market share from it. We are still talking about the importance of uh, Bitcoin's network effect. So uh, a downside of the growing network effect of Bitcoin is the environmental impact. So the Bitcoin network currently consumes as much energy as a small country. And as the network grows bigger, so will the energy needed to maintain it and arguably the carbon footprint. So how should investors look at this problem? Uh, so one is that Bitcoin uses less than 1% of global energy. Uh, and so I, you know, then the second part is, you know, energy usage is fine as long as the work that it's doing is productive and is, and is valuable to people. And so, for example, we don't question, uh, you know, the, the electricity usage of washing machines and, and you know, like clothes washers and dishwashers because they provide us, uh, you know, something that is valuable to us and makes our lives simpler. And so when you look at Bitcoin, the thing is that it scales pretty well. And so it has a, a pretty big uh, energy requirement, uh, but then as it grows, that doesn't scale at the same rate. And so if you look at, say, uh, Bitcoin's energy usage as a percentage of market capitalization, that's been going down every year since inception. And that's because the block subsidy, uh, you know, gets gets cut in half every four years. And so if you look at, you know, the percentage of Bitcoin's market cap spent on security, so it, that's the combination of the subsidies and uh, the transaction fees, that keeps going down. And so it, let's say Bitcoin does continue to grow from here, it becomes a $2 trillion, a $5 trillion asset class, you know, whatever the numbers it reaches. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that energy component is going to go up two to five times uh, because uh, the block subsidy, you know, in, in, in a few years will be cut in half again. And so I don't view the too much energy usage as a problem because of that, that you know, that exponential r reduction in block subsidies. And uh, I'm more focused on making sure that, that Bitcoin continues to use an adequate amount of energy uh, relative to its market cap. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. OK, now to conclude, I would like to ask you one last question. Uh, we don't have a crystal ball, but I was pretty excited to see that you actually got right the latest prediction in our latest interview about reach about Bitcoin reaching one trillion dollar market cap. Uh, so what is the next uh, milestone in terms of uh, market cap that you, you are looking at for the end of this bull cycle? Uh, so I guess uh, I'm looking at uh, Bitcoin over 100,000. Uh, and so, you know, you can call that maybe a, a $2 trillion uh, market cap. Uh, and it's one of those things, you know, that I was uh, very, very high conviction on that, that one trillion market cap. Uh, whereas now, you know, we have to see how this plays out. And so, uh, you know, I think it, it certainly could consolidate and, and disappoint uh, as a reasonable probability. But I also think that there's a pretty good probability that, that uh, you know, it continues to surge from here. And I'm certainly remaining long as part of my portfolio. Awesome. Okay. Thanks a lot, uh, Lynn. That was great to have you with us today. Yep. Thanks for having me.